Okay, good, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining the class today. Morning, Pastor. Morning, Orson, Aaron, Dave, thank you for joining. Morning. And uh, we will pray, and uh, I'm sure the others will join us soon. And uh, we get started. Good. Could one of us please pray? I've uh, started the recording, um, so it's going on. Could one of us uh, please pray and we'll get started? Okay, I'll pray. <clears throat> Father, we come before you and we thank you, Lord God, for this day. We thank you for this opportunity. I think I have in this class of Jesus. Thank you, Father. That you are so loving and wonderful that you care for each one of us, Lord Jesus. No matter how we do, what we're doing, you always love us and you have always shown us your mercy. And you've always been so gracious to us, Lord Jesus. As we learn from your word, Lord Jesus, I pray that your word may touch each one of us, Lord Jesus. Those who have already joined and those who are still yet to join, Lord God, let your spirit work in each uh, one of our hearts, Lord Jesus. Let our hearts be open. Um, and let our hearts be uh, um, accept, uh, acceptance, Lord Jesus, so that every word that our pastors is going to teach us today, Lord Jesus, let those words be alive in, in each one of us, Lord God. We thank you for this opportunity once again, Lord Jesus, and we submit this time into your hand. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thanks. All right. Good morning once again. And um, we have a, a wonderful, or we're going to have a wonderful time in in our study. Um, we are in Romans chapter nine, and um, we uh, actually looked at uh, we or we started off with the first few verses, so we will continue from there. Uh, just a quick, uh, uh, maybe not a not a full recap but just a quick mention um, Romans chapter 9 10 and 11 uh, the Apostle Paul is um, taking a little side trip to address what God is doing with Israel while at the same time he's continuing to work with the church so, uh, like we said in the very beginning, when he's writing to the church at Rome, it's a mixed group. There are Gentiles, but there are also Jewish believers. And so, obviously, uh, there's, there's, there is a lot of concern or a lot of questions on if, uh, if the church is where, you know, what God is working in now, what about the Jewish people? What about all his promises right from the time of uh, Abraham? You know, so uh, Paul is addressing that in chapters 9, 10, 11. And then in chapter 12, he gets back to what we talk about as the general, you know, uh, general Christian life and so on. So these are very interesting chapters. Um, also, these are somewhat difficult chapters, um, especially when from the point of um, God's uh, purpose, God's predetermined purpose. So that's a big question that's being addressed and which we will see as we go forward in chapter nine. You know, and uh, out of these chapters actually uh, have come two different uh, schools of thinking. Uh, you could even say two different schools of theology in the Christian church. Uh, there is this one side, which is uh, Calvinistic, uh, which is, uh, you know, John Calvin was a great theologian. And uh, he, as we will see in chapter nine itself, he basically, if you want to summarize what his theology was, he placed everything on the sovereignty of God, uh, on, a, on the predetermined purpose of God. 
to the point where human will became almost negligible. So that's a Calvinistic school of thought, theology. On the other side, there is what is known as the Armenian, Armenianism, which takes into account, I mean, it recognizes the sovereignty of God, but takes into account the choice of man, and it somehow makes an attempt to reconcile the two. Meaning God is sovereign, but we make the final choice. Whereas in Calvinistic theology, it's we don't have that. Our, it's almost like our choice has been predetermined by God. So we will see as we go to Romans 9, why we have these two differing schools of thought in Christian theology. Uh, so then there are a lot of uh, traditional denominations uh, and theologians who uh, subscribe to the Calvinistic school of theology. I mean, that way of thinking and that way of looking at scripture and understanding God. And then there is, I would say, perhaps, and I, there's, uh, we, uh, we may not be able to quantify it, but perhaps the, uh, a larger group, especially the a larger group that subscribes to Armenianism, which tries to reconcile the sovereignty of God with also keeping the free will of man intact. Uh, it seems like a lot of the traditional denominations, uh, especially the Baptist, uh, mainland evangelical denominations, would subscribe to a Calvinistic type of theology. Uh, out of that came what was known as a, a Reformed theology, uh, which is kind of branched out of Calvin's theology and trying to, again, you know, be uh, accommodate uh, human will, uh, the, ro the role of human will. So there's a, you hear about reformed churches, uh, reformed, you know, uh, those who have come out of this and then trying to adapt to a lot of, uh, so, so a lot of the Pentecostal, charismatic, spirit-filled, type of churches, most of them, or probably all of them, would subscribe to the um, school of thought uh, that tries to reconcile both the sovereignty of God and the will of man, generally speaking, right? And then you have people somewhere in between who kind of go back and forth, uh, so on. But you will see when you read Romans 9 why that that whole area is so difficult to, um, to come to a firm understanding. Uh, okay, anyway, let's get into it. And then as we read scripture, you'll find out you know, why this is uh, so challenging. Uh, let's read again the first five verses. We did read it last week, uh, but let's pick up from where we paused. Romans chapter 9, verses 1 to 5. Somebody could read that for us, please. Romans 9, 1 through 5. Yes. I feel the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I wish that I myself were accused for, from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelite, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenant, covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is all, over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Amen. So, we just started, you know, uh, looking at these, this passage uh, last week. Um, we were at verse 1, where verse 1 and 2, where Paul is saying, 
you know, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. So we were talking about conscience. We're talking about the witness, uh, uh, the witness of the conscience and the witness of the Holy Spirit. So within all of us as people, uh, every human person has a conscience. The conscience is basically the voice of the human spirit. So we are spirit, soul, and body. Uh, in, your, in the human spirit, God has put the law, like we saw in Romans chapter 2, um, and the exact verses um, uh, 15, Romans 2, 15, the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness between themselves. So Romans 2, 15, so uh, God has put the law within man's heart, and uh, as, as, a, as a spirit speaks or a spirit bears witness or is tell, telling him, that's the conscience. It's the voice of the human spirit. But what Paul is saying is, uh, but as believers, we also have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in our spirit. So we have a double witness, the witness of our own conscience and the witness of what the Holy Spirit is telling us. And that's what Paul is here saying, look, you know, uh, whatever I'm telling you, my conscience is, you know, is attesting to it. And the Holy Spirit himself within me is also attesting to this. That, uh, you know, I have such great, um, verse two, you know, uh, you, can, you can feel Paul's burden. Uh, his continual grief and uh, sorrow for his own people, the Jewish people. Um, so, like we said, although Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles uh, and was taking the gospel to the Gentiles, he still had a great heart for his own people, the Jewish people. Uh, to the point where he said in verse 3, you know, uh, I wish I could be cursed. You know, almost like I could go to hell just for the sake of if my countrymen, if that would save my uh, countrymen according to the flesh. That is all the Jewish brethren that he was so concerned about. So you see, Paul is setting things up for what he's going to say. He's identifying himself as, look, I am a preacher of the gospel. I'm a preacher of the Christian faith. But I actually was, uh, I am also a Jew. And I, you know, he was actually a, a great person in Judaism. So he says, so he's kind of positioning himself saying, look, I'm in both sides, meaning I am part of the church. I am an apostle of the church of Jesus Christ. But I'm also a Jew. And I have a great heart for my own people. It's not like, okay, I, I've completely abandoned my connection with the Jewish people. And I'm only pursuing the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. No. I have a great heart for my own people. So he's positioning himself because he's going to talk now for the for, you know for three chapters now about Jews and the church. Right? So he's saying, look, I have a heart for my people. And in verse four, he recognizes uh, what a great privilege God has given the Jewish people, people of Israel. You know, he says uh, uh, to them, uh, who are his legs, to whom pertain the adoption. That means, you know, uh, the adoption really means people who are brought in to be part of the family of God, right? So God chose these people and uh, he wanted them to be his own. Uh, we see that in the Old Testament, God had chosen them. And the Old Testament, you read it off, and, you know, there's who, who's like you, there's no one other, no other nation like you under heaven to whom God has given his law and his commandments and he has blessed in such a measure. You know? So they knew they were these chosen people who were brought to be God's own people. Uh, then secondly, verse 4, they, they experienced the glory of God. They received the covenants of God. Uh, they, they, they had the law that was given to them. They had the service of God, the whole ministry, you know, the whole, the priesthood, 
that was given to them and uh, the promises were given to them. The promises of all that God was going to do was given to these people. Now, of course, what Paul is going to tell us later on is that through them, it's gone to the Gentiles. But he's starting off from where God started. Then God started with Israel. He started with the Jewish people and he, he blessed them with all of this. He put, gave all this to them first. Right? He says, uh, and the promises were five and from them come the fathers from whom according to the flesh Christ came. So he says, it was from this nation, from the Jewish people came the fathers. So that is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they recognize David as a great patriarch of this entire nation. So he says, you know, the fathers were all people of the of the Israel. And even Jesus Christ came in the natural, according to the flesh. He came from this nation. Right? So what Paul is saying is, look, the Jewish people have been so privileged. And when I say Jews, we can use the word Israel interchangeably. Um, uh, at this point, uh, so he says, these people are so privileged. God, you know, started with them. He gave them all these things. And even Jesus Christ came from them in the natural. Right? And uh, just want to point out there in verse 5, that when he talks about Christ, he calls Jesus as uh, the eternally blessed God. So that's important. Because sometimes people ask, you know, uh, where does the Bible say that Jesus Christ is God? Uh, you know, and especially, and this question, of course, would come primarily from the Jehovah's Witnesses who don't believe that Jesus is God. They, they refer to Jesus as a great being. So this, where does the Bible say Jesus is God? And here's one of the places, that there, there are the places as well. Uh, verse 5, Christ, the eternally blessed God. Clear, no doubt. Christ is also referred to as the Son of God, the Son of Man, you know, by different titles uh, that uh, are specific to different things that he did. But he's very clearly referred to as the eternally blessed God, here in Romans 9, verse 5. Okay, so Romans 9, verses 1 to 5, Paul is positioning himself of his heart for the Jewish people, and also is very clear the Jews are a very special people. They are a chosen people. Israel is a very special nation. So he's very clear about that. You know, in no way is he discounting all of that just because of the church is not doing that okay so now we go from verses 6 through 13 and now we are beginning into this getting into this whole foreknowledge of God the predetermined purpose of God and that we're getting into that quite a quite difficult uh, portion okay so Romans chapter 9 let's go from verses 6 to 13 please somebody could read that for us But it is not that word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor the nor are they all children, because they are seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is those who are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are count as the seed. For this is the word of the promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac. For the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the, prom that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of work but of him who calls it was said to her the older shall serve the younger as it is written jacob i have loved but esau 
I have hate. Hate it. Mm. Okay. So now, verses 6 to, two, 6 to 13. So Paul is saying, all right. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. It's not like what God has spoken has just fallen by the wayside. So, so look, this is a nation. God has chosen them. And he spoke wonderful things about them. This nation, Israel. And he says, but of course, in the back of the minds of the people the, whom he's writing to, they're all thinking about the church now. You know, the, the, the church of Jesus Christ. So he says, wait. What God spoke to them, it's not that the word that he spoke to them has gone wasted. It hasn't gone wasted. So that's verse 6. It is not that the word of God has taken no effect. This doesn't mean God's word spoken about the Jews and the nation of Israel has become ineffective. No, no, no. So then he begins to explain. He says, you know, uh, not everybody who is a Jew in the natural is whom God was referring to. What God was saying, what, what, so what, what Paul is bringing out is, when God said, in Isaac will be your seed, your descendants, he was talking about children of promise. He wasn't just talking about the natural children, he was talking about children of promise. They are the ones who are the real descendants that God was speaking about. That's in verse 8. So the children of promise are counted as the seed. So really what he's setting them up for is children of promise are basically people of faith or believers who are Jews and Gentile believers. That's what he's referring to, children of promise. So what he's saying, it's not those who are children of the flesh, I mean, it's just, just because they're born Jewish or born of that nation, that's God wasn't actually referring to just them. He was referring to children of promise, meaning those who would be of faith, believers. It's going to come to that. So, so he stated this. And he says, because God gave a promise. And he said, I will come. And Sarah will have a son. So he's introduced this thought that the, the real descendants that God was talking about were children of promise. He's given the thought, brought the thought, put the thought on the table, so to speak. And then he starts talking about something else. He says, verse 10. And not only this, that means I'm giving you one more thought. So, for, so he, he, what he's supporting, he's saying what God spoke, that's verse 6, what God spoke to the nation of Israel, that word has not become in effect. That means God's promises to his people are still there. But first, I want you to understand that God was, when God said, in Isaac your seed will be called, or when he told Sarah, I will come and Sarah will have a son, he was giving a promise. And in effect, he was saying that it's the children of the promise, not just natural born children in Israel, but children of the promise through whom all that he had, the word he had given this nation of Israel was going to be fulfilled. First thought. Then, not only that, but this also. What does he say? This is in verse 10. He says, think about this. Isaac and Rebecca, 
even before Rebecca gave birth, God said, the older shall serve the younger. That is, Esau, I mean, Rebecca gave birth to twins, Esau and Jacob, but because Esau came out first, he was considered the older. So the older will serve the younger. And verse 13, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. So he brings in the second, um, I, should, I shouldn't say idea, but I should say truth, the second truth, that even before the children were born, even before they could do any, you know, have any say in anything, God already said, the older will serve the younger. I have loved one, I've hated the other. So this is what he refers to in verse 11. So verse 11 is like the, the big verse, the big verse. For the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election. That means God's per predetermined purpose through which he already selected, in this case, he already selected Jacob. So the children had no part in this. The people had no part in this. God himself in order to carry out a purpose, he selected or he elected. The word elected can be, you, you can use the, the modern word election, selection. He selected. And God's selection was not based on works. That means he didn't select Jacob after Jacob had grown up and become a big man and, and done all the good things, then God said, oh yeah, yeah, he's a good man, so let me select. It was not based on works. It was even before they were born, even before they um, they had done any good or bad. So not of works, but of him who calls. That means God selected according to his purpose, and according to his calling, that means his choosing on the person. So verse 11 is like a big verse, a pivotal verse. Now, like what we have to do with scripture, all scripture must be interpreted and understood in the light of the rest of scripture. If we take just this verse by itself, or the few verses that we read, or perhaps even what we re are going to read in chapters 9, 10, 11, it may leave us with the impression that, look, we have no, no say in all of this. These two children, even before they were born, God already decided who was going to serve whom and uh, whom he loved and whom he hated. Now we will talk about verse 13, why God said that. We will explain it. But uh, I'm just trying to focus on verse 11 now. You know, if we just go by verse 11 or even what we are going to go through in verses chapters 9, 10, 11, we might come to this conclusion that, hey, Everything's already determined by God. Uh, he has already selected whom he wants to select. It is all according to his purpose. And uh, he calls whomever he wants to. And uh, we just uh, have no say in anything. It might seem like that. But, sorry, 
all of scripture has to be understood in the light of the rest of scripture. What do we see in the rest of scripture? We see clearly, without a question, the free will of man. We see very clearly. So, as we're going to go through chapter 9, 10, 11, we have to understand it and we have to interpret it without discrediting the free moral agency of man. Otherwise, if I close my eyes, I mean, you know, if I um, just put blinders on and I look only at chapters 9, 10, 11, it's very likely I will come away with this idea that God has already decided everything. We are just like puppets. Uh, God just uses us to fulfill his purpose. And uh, each one is already predetermined for something. And uh, that's it. But we shouldn't do that. We shouldn't read that blinders on. We should say, what does the rest of scripture teach? Right from Genesis, we know. Man has a freedom to choose. Adam made a choice. God didn't stop it. God didn't predetermine Adam's choice. God didn't dictate Adam's choice. Adam's choice was Adam's choice. God had a plan. that in spite of Adam's wrong choice, God had a plan. But God did not determine Adam's choice. So, and like that, you know, you read about all the men of God, you read about Moses, you know, God didn't predetermine that Moses would strike the rock twice. No, that was what Moses did. And because of that, Moses, the great man of God, could not enter the land of promise. God didn't predetermine it. God knew it, of course, but that was Moses' action. And Moses himself paid a price for that. And like that, you know, we could go on through uh, the Old Testament, go through the New Testament, and we can say, look, all these people, great men and women of God, they had a free will and they exercised it. And uh, some of them, there were times when they made the right choices and some there were times when they made the wrong choices. But the purpose of God was not um, derailed just because they made a wrong choice. God ultimately fulfilled his purpose. He went on with it. So with that in mind, we need to understand this chapter. So what is, you know, and so what Paul is saying, look, there was the purpose of God for Jacob and Esau. And in God's predetermined purpose, he already said, the older will serve the younger. But in stating that, or in giving forth the prophecy, what we would, you know, today we call it prophecy because he spoke it before they were even born. In stating that prophecy, he was not predetermining their choices. He was only stating ahead of time what their choices were going to be. And God was equally open to both of them. But because of their choices, he declared ahead of time, whom he would love and whom he would hate. In stating, Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. He is not saying, I already made up my mind about these two before they are born. No, it is based on what they would be doing. It was based on you know, what 
the, the, the choices they would eventually make. But he declared it even before they was they were even born, before they even had uh, they could make any choice, uh, make any of their uh, uh, do any of those things, even before they had any works to show. He already foretold it, but they were still free to make their choice. But why did God love Jacob? and hate Esau. We read about this in Hebrews 12. So if you go with me to Hebrews 12, and we, we will get an understanding of why this was the case. So let's just go to Hebrews 12. I will, I will um, explain this, then I will pause. We'll take questions um, in case um, things are uh, not clear, All right? So let's go to Hebrews 12. And let's read from verse 15 through 17, please. Hebrews 12, 15 through 17. Somebody could read it for us. Hebrews 12, 15 through 17. Yes, yes. Looking carefully, list anyone fall short of the grace of God. List any root of bitterness, springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit, inherit the blessings, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Mm. So here, the writer of Hebrews is, uh, you know, referring to Esau with quite harsh words. He says, he, he refers to verse 16. He refers to him as a fornicator or profane person like Esau. That's pretty harsh words. But what was Esau's, what did Esau do? What was the main problem? He sold his birthright just because for, for the sake of one meal. So we know the story, like, you know, he had just come back from his hunting and he was very tired, very hungry. And Jacob said, hey, you give me your birthright as the firstborn all the blessings that you have as firstborn, that's the birthright, and I'll give you a meal. And at that moment, Esau, you know, he could have said, no, I can't give you my birthright. You know, he could have gone and fixed himself some food or, you know, just, I mean, refused to do that. But at that moment, he gave up his birthright just for one meal. And that's just representing a man of the flesh, a man who was living for the immediate gratification of the flesh. Whereas Jacob, on the other hand, was not a perfect man. Right? He, we know he was, uh, he cheated his own brother, he cheated his own father and uh, he ran away and all of that so jacob was not a perfect man it's, you know in fact the name jacob means cheater or supplanter he was not a perfect man but yet in spite of all his imperfections he had a heart toward god he had a heart toward god so what was the difference between Jacob and Esau? Esau was willing to give up everything God had on his life. That is the birthright. Just for the sake of meeting the need of the flesh. Whereas Jacob, he, in spite of all his weaknesses, somehow sought God in everything. Somehow sought God. He had weaknesses, not a perfect person, but he sought God. 
And so, knowing that, God is saying, this is what's going to happen. The older Esau will serve the younger, Jacob. Jacob I've loved, Esau I've hated. So God is not predetermining their choices and what they do in life, but he's speaking ahead of time, saying, this is how my purpose is going to unfold. This is what I see them, you know, what I see their choices. And this is the unfolding of my purpose. And therefore, these are the ones who would become the selected or elected of God. These are ones who would become the called of God. And these are the ones through whom the purpose of God will be fulfilled. This is how it's going to be fulfilled. So God speaks that ahead of time based on foreknowledge, not based on predetermining our individual choices. Because if God had predetermined Jacob's choice, uh, Esau's choice, then Esau can turn to God and say, God, I'm not to blame. You determine my choice. Which is something Paul is going to, you know, kind of get into further on. He's using the he's going to use the analogy of the potter and the clay. Right? So it's it's a pretty um, tough thing to understand. Can the clay tell the potter, you know, I want to be made like this? No, the clay is in the hand of the potter, and the potter decides. But yet, there's one big difference between the clay and us human beings. There is a commonality between the clay and us. We are both made of dust, but there's one big difference. The clay does not have a free will. We do. So later on, Paul is going to use that analogy, but we need to keep in mind the fact that we have a free will. So we have to understand it in the context of the free will. Okay. So let me pause here. And, uh, you know, we, we definitely need to read a little bit, uh, read through this chapter to, to understand how the full picture of what Paul is saying uh, in terms of God's purpose, God's election, God's calling, and the place of free will. So you can you can right away tell that I am intentionally interpreting it from this angle of trying to balance both the sovereign sovereignty of God while maintaining the integrity of free will. And I'm not, you know, on this side where we just say everything is God's sovereign purpose and uh, it was already predetermined and I didn't have any choice in the matter. I didn't have any say in the matter. So I'm not interpreting it from that perspective. What I what do want to say is that there are people who would interpret it that way, that Esau had no choice because God already predetermined he would serve Jacob and he would be hated. But I'm trying to intentionally maintain the free will that both Jacob and Esau had, which they did exercise. So I'm going to pause here. I'll take up any questions. Uh, then we go for a break and then we will come back and continue. Uh, what are things clear or I mean, or are there is are there any questions at this time? I just a quick one. Um, sure. Like a, there's a certain definition of, say, uh, 
this thing called a, a cult or a cult. Um, a, a cult is anything that's moving away from the truth, isn't it? Like, I mean, I'm just paraphrasing the definition. Mm -hmm. but, um, so uh, Calvinism uh, and some of their beliefs uh, is, I think they have something called like the tulip or something that uh, that they follow, right? Uh, and so is it is it is it that isn't that moving away from the truth, like as we are learning? And uh, um, so so uh, see, some things about the cult, a cult, something that's very cultish is um, that. Um, so one 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 uh what's say one sign of course is that they're going away from the truth but i think uh, but a second important sign is that people within a cult are controlled by a leader or leaders or by the organization their choices and everything controlled by that okay. uh, saying so that so that's when we say hey that's cultish because the people are not allowed to you know do their own thing it's all dictated for them uh, by the organization or by the people running the organization now in calvinism i feel it's only uh, uh we wouldn't call it um, cultish or we would just say it's a different perspective or a different interpretation of uh, a different theological understanding of scripture uh, but the core beliefs are the same meaning the core beliefs of jesus christ the cross the triune god the bible you know those core beliefs are the same just in, in this aspect you know, there are different, like I said, um, schools views. of thought or different views, and they espouse this view that God decided everything. Okay. And uh, so it just happens according to God's purpose. But they don't, uh, yeah, so the other things that, you know, that are generally go with the cult are not there. So we wouldn't, you know, call them that. Uh, just that the views or understanding are in this aspect is different. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Mister. Okay. I see your I see others comments on the chat. Okay. Things are fine. Clear. Need some time to understand. Okay. So yeah, it takes some time to think about it. Uh, so I'm going a little slow um, in this chapter, chapter nine, especially because as we read some more. It's going to get a little bit more complicated, but uh, you know, we just as we journey through it, you know, it'll all come together. Eventually, what Paul is working towards is to give us an understanding on how God is still working both in the Jewish people and in the church, and how God is going to bring these two together. That's what he'll come to in chapter 11. He'll show us how both this will come together. So it's a beautiful journey. It's a little complicated now, but he shows us how God will bring both his plan for Israel and his plan for the church, bring them together. Okay, so let's take a quick 10 minute break and we'll be back and we'll pick up with verse 14. Okay, thank you. <laughs> 